Grace up. Grace the Lord. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap this morning. Lord, we honour you. Lord, we bless you. We welcome you to come to speak to our hearts. Lord, we hungry for you today. We hunger for fire from heaven to infire our hearts, to set us on fire again. We reach out to you, Lord, today, crying out to you for a fresh experience, fresh encounter. We want to walk out of this place changed. Lord, we open ourselves to you. We say, come, Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord one more clap. Well, let me hear you clap this time. Let me just hear you clap. I can't hear you still. Come on. Let's shout to Him. Thank you, Lord. We honor you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Well, it's wonderful to be here. And a special welcome to the uh, online uh, uh, watchers, observers, participators. Great to have you with us. And why don't we give a clap to our worship team. That was just fantastic today. Thank you so much. Man, I just enjoyed that so much. It was just great. And uh, it's hard to follow Dave after last week. What a great preacher that was. And uh, how many are really enjoying the messages he's bringing? I think they're fantastic. They're really good. And I thought last week's one was just really exceptional. Very, very good. And uh, he said, oh, well, you carry on after that. And I think, well, that's, that's a challenge, isn't it, eh? Yeah, I like it that it's hard to follow now. I've got to really work, work to keep ahead. That's pretty something, isn't it? Why don't you open your Bible with me in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 30. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 30. And uh, I wanted to pick up just the theme that we had last week was uh, the area of the spirit of loneliness and why people are alone. And I, I looked and thought about it a bit and uh, which aspect to take. And I felt the Lord speak to me just to take a bigger picture of which the area of dealing with loneliness is just a part of it. And uh, I want to just start off here. And the, the message I want to speak today is called Repair the Altar of the Lord. Repair the Altar of the Lord. And without talking with Pastor Kate, she picked it up in the spirit and was just actually had a song that was all about yielding to him, a fresh yielding to the Lord. And I want to just talk with you out of the scripture. It comes out of 1 Kings chapter 18. It's the story of Elijah and Elijah's encounter with the people of God. And what you need to understand is the condition of the nation. The nation was a place of spiritual oppression. The nation was in a place of poverty. The nation was a place where uh, families were broken down. That's why it says in Malachi, he will send the spirit of Elijah to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. So when you read the passage there, it doesn't clearly outline just how deep the issue was in the nation. In other words, the nation was under spiritual bondage and spiritual oppression, and the people were affected by it. Now, when we look in the Old Testament, there are tremendous examples or pictures of natural things but you've got to learn to take them through the filter of the cross of Christ and see what that means for me today. So as I look at this message, I'm going to show you how to bring it from the Old Testament and bring it right down to where our life is right now. And you remember the story uh, of Elijah and how there was a confrontation. What he's confronting is a spirit that is governing the minds of the people. And what essentially he does he brings them into an encounter with God, and out of that encounter, they make the decision to turn away from what they were under and begin to walk uh, with the Lord. Now, when you look at Israel, you find that Israel was the nation that represented God in the earth. The center of the nation in Jerusalem was around the altar of the Lord. In fact, the whole of the nation's government centered around the worship center in the, in the, uh, right in the middle of Jerusalem there. And uh, I won't get on to all of the things around that, but it's out of that the heavenly government of God flowed into the earth through the realm of worship and the altar. That was the center of the nation's health. So when you looked at the nation, every time the altar was neglected, every time the priesthood was neglected, every time the nation neglected the place of worship and centrality of worship, then the nation went into decline, which affected every kind of area. I've never seen a couple come to get married that expected to end in divorce. I've never seen parents have children and dedicate them or, or bring them into church that expected their children would go off the rails. I've never seen anyone that expected that there'd be tragedies in their family or in their finances. People 
we don't expect that. We look for something else. But what we don't realize is the core of having blessing in our life is retaining the altar of the Lord, the centrality of Jesus Christ in our personal life. Now, I can tell you, I've lived in this nation a few years now. There is a spirit of passivity and rejection sits over the nation. And if you don't do something to encounter God in your own life, you will carry that on you wherever you go. And it will deplete you, depress you. It will steal from your marriage, your relationship with your children, every area. It requires that we make a decision that we will have in our life a place of encounter with God where we're constantly being refreshed. So let's have a look at the scripture here. I want to just read it to you now. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 30. And it says, He repaired the altar of the Lord which was broken down. And God has been speaking to me about that scripture. I've had it in my phone every time I look at my diary for the day. I have the verse, comes up, he repaired the altar of the Lord. So what is an altar? What did he have to do? And we find when we read the story, he repaired the altar of the Lord. He laid a sacrifice on it. Let's read the scriptures there in verse 30. It says, uh, Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. How did he repair it? He took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and so on and so forth. And then as he offered the sacrifice, he called on the Lord. Now notice this, that fire fell from heaven when the sacrifice had been made. First, he prepared the altar, and the altar was made of stones, 12 stones, each stone representing one of the tribes of Israel, and he put them all together to make an altar. In other words, every stone was linked and united with the other stones around a central purpose of putting an altar, of building an altar to the Lord. And then when he put the sacrifice on it and stood back and called on the Lord, fire came from heaven. Now, you'll find in the Bible that fire from heaven falls in a number of places. And every time that fire falls from heaven, it's always on a sacrifice on an altar. So we read in the book of Exodus that when they built the tabernacle and they set out the offering, it says, fire fell from heaven on the offering. Fire fell from heaven, ignited the uh, whole uh, the, the sacrifice and everything. It was all consumed. We find in the days of David, David built an altar, made a sacrifice to the Lord, and fire fell from heaven. And uh, then we find in Solomon's days, Solomon built a temple, and he made an altar to the Lord. And when everything was in place and everyone was in one mind, one heart, fire fell from heaven. And then we find in the New Testament, there's a final example of it, and this is the one we'll draw near to, and that is when they had spent time together uniting their hearts to seek the Lord and becoming as one altar to the Lord, then fire fell on that altar and ignited a revival that's still going in the world today. So right through the Bible, fire comes from heaven on the sacrifice on the altar. So we don't want to ask the question. You want to get it clear, see, because otherwise you have the spiritual language, but you need to catch what it may mean for us in our life. So first of all, what is the altar? What is an altar? An altar in the Bible was always a place of encountering God. So when we see the word altar, we find it's a place that they built, and its purpose was to have an encounter with God. Its purpose was to renew covenant with God. So every time you saw an altar, an altar was a place of meeting with God or renewing covenant with God. It was always about the relationship with God. And inevitably, with the altar, we find in this particular situation here, you notice there it said he had 12 stones. So I thought through a little bit and meditated on what for us the altar is. And the way I see it very clearly, the altar that you and I have today, that old altar has been done away with. Now there is a new altar. The altar is your heart. Your heart is the place you encounter God. Your heart is the place you make covenant with God. Your heart is the place where God speaks with you. Your heart is the place where you meet with Him. Your heart is the place where the fire of God falls. God falls upon a heart that is ready and prepared and open and hungry. So 
for us today, we need to say then, it's about our heart. Now, you notice there in the story, it tells us that he put the 12 stones together. In other words, he took the people of God, all of them together. The altar the fire fell on was not just something individual. This is about a nation, about a group of people. Now, one of the problems we have as Westerners is we think individualistically. That's the nature of the Western culture, which is about 20% of the world. It's to think in terms of me, my, my rights, my privileges, my relationship with God, my blessings, my ministry, my this, my blah, 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 blah. It's all about I, me, and my. Okay? But the Bible culture and the culture of 70% of the world is a collective culture. It's all about community. It's all about family. It's all about God's people together. That's why the Bible says when you are born again, you are placed into a body called the body of Christ. It's a body of people, a corporate body. So there's no such thing as I, me, and my ministry. I am part of a body. That's one of the revelations we get in baptism. God put us in a body. And the Bible says God sets us into a local church as it pleases him. So it pleases God that he puts you in a place where you're connected to other believers. And you'll see the purpose of it in a moment. So notice one of the things we see there in the story of the altar is the altar was made up of stones coming together. And that's where the fire fell. It speaks of our hearts being united in one purpose together. And I'll come across that again a little later, very clearly in New Testament teaching. So we see there the altar. The altar is very, very clear what the altar is. The fire, when we talk about the fire falling, the fire of God always is a picture of the Holy Spirit. It says he will come like a consuming fire. Let me just get this out of the way here. He will come like a consuming fire. So fire, in the New Testament, when the Holy Ghost fell, he fell with fire. So fire falling from heaven is always symbolic of God's presence and power coming to ignite something in the earth, coming to demonstrate his glory and majesty, coming to bring a transformation to someone's life, the fire of God. You and I need the fire of God. For many people, the fire of God is very, very weak in their lives. When we are full of the fire of God, there is a passion, there's a life, there's something inside you that ignites you, that makes you different, you see? And the dilemma we, and I'll come back to that when I talk about the priesthood in a moment and your responsibilities. So the fire of God is the power of God. And what does it fall on? It falls on a sacrifice. So all through the Bible, you'll find the sacrifices. God set up a sacrificial system. Not that he was interested in that, but it was all to picture something later on of the sacrifice of Christ. So what is a sacrifice? A sacrifice, it costs you something. A sacrifice, you yield up something of value in exchange for something of greater value. So a person makes a sacrifice for their children. That means they give up time or money or energy or whatever, but they have in mind a great benefit coming from it. You don't just squander your life. That would be wasting it. When a person makes a sacrifice, they have in mind that although what they're giving up is valuable, what they will receive as a result of it is more valuable. So right through the Bible, they would offer up a sacrifice, but what they received was the favor of God, the blessing of God, which touched their marriages, their families, their finances. They prospered because of the sacrifices that they offered. So sacrifice is all through the Bible. It is the very nature of God, and it's the nature of love to be sacrificial to lay down something that's precious for yourself so someone else can benefit from what you've given up. So we see then a sacrifice then always is the surrender of something valuable to me, but it has in mind by faith something more valuable will come to me. So I look and I see the sacrifices we made in our early years. And were they sacrifices? Yes, they were. A lot of people thought we were very, very foolish. A lot of people disagreed. But I saw that if I did this, there was something far greater that God would have. And so now I'm living in the days when I can look back and say, oh, I forgot my sacrifice, but my, I really enjoyed the blessing of God. So there's a sacrifice that you make for marriage. There's a sacrifice you make for your children. There's a sacrifice you make to walk with God. All of these cost you something. The world wants to get something for nothing. 
wants to borrow and then perhaps pay it back one day. That's not how God works. God works with a sacrificial system. You come up front and you present something and God then produces a blessing that far outweighs what you gave up. And say amen to that. Well, you have to, I can tell you it from testimony. I can tell you it from testimony. I, give you, I could spend quite a little time talking about various things we sacrificed to the Lord and how God blessed us. So you notice there, the fire will always fall on a heart that is committed to yield something to the Lord. The fire of God will come on a heart that is yielded and is giving up something to the Lord. And I want to talk about the, some specific sacrifices that God calls us to offer, and the Bible tells us these things are really pleasing to Him. So let's have a look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Frequently we try to solve problems without looking at what the really the root issue is and deal with the root issue. So we look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And uh, it says in verse 4, pick it up in verse 4. Now coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and very precious. It says, so we come to Jesus Christ and we see that he was rejected by men, but in the eyes of God, God honored him for what he did and raised him up. And he says, you also, so you also, including us with Christ, as living stones are being built a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable or pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Then it goes down to verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Now notice what it tells us there, it talks about being a priesthood. He said, you are living stones which God is building together. So in the Bible, uh, thinking and mindset, there's no such thing as individuals. It's always about the corporate body of Christ. It's always about God's community, the community of believers. So he starts with working with one person, but through the Bible, he begins to expand his plan to build a holy nation, a nation of people who have come under Jesus as their king and reflect his life on the earth, his culture on the earth. So we see here, it tells us that you are a royal priesthood, or you're a priesthood chosen by God to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So what does a priest do? For many people, their concept of a priest is uh, some particular minister, someone wearing gowns and robes and whatever, and uh, that's a priest. And uh, what we don't understand frequently is that the Bible teaches that all believers are called to be priests of God. Every believer is called to be a priest of God. It's called the priesthood of all believers. Now, when you became a Christian, when you gave your life to Christ, you didn't, there's some things that you didn't have any say over. The first thing is you're born into a new family. Second thing is it's a royal family, therefore you've got royal blood in you. Thirdly, the moment you're born into the family of God, you become part of a royal priesthood. So every person here who's a believer in Jesus Christ is part of a royal priesthood. In other words, a kingly origin, but you're called to function as a priest. What is a priest? A priest is a person set apart to fulfill a priestly function. A priest is a person who is called to act as God's, act as a representative and come between man and God. So if you, every one of us as a priest is called to come before God. That's the divine act. That's the privilege that you have. The priests in the Old Testament were just a few people. They were one tribe. They were a selected group. But now every person has the honor and privilege of being a priest to God. So what is the responsibilities of a priest? There were four responsibilities a priest had. Here's number one. Number one responsibility was to keep the fire on the altar burning. Hey? Now, the altar, remember, is your heart. It's your responsibility to keep the fire of love and passion for Christ alive inside you. It's your job to keep that fire going. And if you neglect the fire, it will diminish, diminish. What will be the effect? You become lukewarm on the inside. You become casual about your commitments to Christ. You begin to start to find other things more attractive. And before you know it, you've got very little 
activity of the Spirit in your life, but there's a lot of worldly activity, a lot of things which may be good, may not be good, but they're things which have taken you away. You've actually lost the passion, lost the fire. When we live in New Zealand, you've got to do something to get that fire. You've got to do something to keep that fire. Because everywhere around you, you find this negativity, you find this discouragement, you find this heaviness, you find many, many things that would cause uh, a positive attitude to be diminished. There's a lot of things around that would dismiss your faith in Christ, mock and belittle you. You've got to actually make a commitment to keep the fire alive. And there's some things you can do to keep the fire alive. And when people have a fire burning, it carries, it affects the people around them. I hate the passivity of New Zealand. I hate it more than you can realize. Because what happens is passivity comes with a religious spirit. And what happens then is people have a form of religion. They turn up at church, but there's absolutely no life, no power, no presence, no good fruit, nothing. It's as dead as dodos. And yet the confusion is in the mind. I'm doing okay. I was raised with all of that thing. I don't want a part of that. I react inside to anything religious. As soon as things become passive and shut down, that's not God. Where's the passion? Where's the fire? You know, if you're enthusiastic, maybe there's different ways of expressing. It should show in your life. If you've got a fire burning inside you, others should feel it. They feel the passion. You got to in love with your wife, you get engaged and get married. There's a passion. That passion, you're responsible to keep it alive. I watch people get married about four years, five years later. You look and think, what the heck? They're not even talking to one another. Sitting at the table, they've both got phones. They, what is all that about? That's not passion. See, and some of you have been around a while and the passion's gone. And this is a reason the passion goes, because you neglected the fire on the altar. You neglected to keep it alive. Your heart is your responsibility. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart diligently, because that determines the course and limitations of your life. I want to be around people that are on fire. I want to keep my heart on fire. I do not want to burn out and end up where I'm just turning up and there's no passion for Jesus. You see what I'm saying? So number one responsibility was to keep the fire burning. Number two, two responsibility was to come into the presence of God and make an offering to God. The privilege of a priest is to return to God gratitude to him for all that he has done. I had one guy say to me, I could hardly believe it. He said, I don't see what God has done for me. Well, man, I wonder if you're even saved. Do you know anything about the cross? Do you know about the price he paid? Do you know the sacrifice he made? Do you know what he suffered on the cross? Go read about the cross. Find what God did. Find what he's done on our behalf. God has done his part. It's up to us to respond. Our response to the great sacrifice of someone giving his life for us would be to come with gratitude to him. But you've got to keep that alive in your heart. Otherwise, it's like it becomes a religious thing. Oh, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and blah, 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 blah. Now listen, it's not that's a reality in this. Someone gave his life up and suffered a horrendous death for me. How am I going to respond? Will I respond with half-heartedness or will there be a deep gratitude? And I have to keep coming back to him and honoring him and blessing him. See, every one of us is called. You've got the right of access to God. So you are a priest. Whether you're a priest or not is not the question. Whether you're a faithful priest who fulfills his office is. That is the true question. It's not whether you're a priest or not. God's already appointed you to that. The question is whether you're a faithful priest, you keep the fire on the altar burning, and you keep that by being in the presence of God, coming to Him with gratitude and worship. Third responsibility of a priest is to intercede, to pray the blessing of God on others. If you're a parent, if you're a man, and you're a father, you should be leading the prayer. You're the priest in the home. Your wife's a priest in the home. Everyone who's born again is a priest in the home, but dad must give leadership. Leadership to build a fire to the Lord, to build a devotion space in the house that the presence of God is made welcome. Wife will support them in this, and they work together in prayer together, but someone has got to step up and say, God, we're calling on your name. My kids all knew that I prayed. They heard me. Their friends knew I prayed too. They had a bit of explaining to do. What's dad doing? Well, I do. I praying in tongues. So they would, we could hear me praying in tongues all over the house. 
you know, I didn't realize how hard to carry, but you know, you get a preacher's voice, you carry a long way. And uh, so anyway, but, but do you, is, you, is there a place of prayer bell? That's our job as a priest, to, to intercede. So I pray for my family. I pray not just for Dave and Kate. I pray for all of my children, all of their spouses. I pray for each of the grandchildren by name and the spouses they'll marry. Why do I pray for that? Because that's what an intercessor is supposed to do. That's what grandparents are supposed to do. Why? Because if they marry the wrong person, you're going to lose your legacy. Everything you work to build will be lost in a generation. And don't say it won't happen. I've seen it happen. I've been around a long time. I've seen almost everything you can see. So we must build in prayer. You cannot presume because you have a fire burning that anyone else in your family and the next generation will. You've got to intentionally invest for that to happen. And the best way, first of all, is coming to the presence of God yourself and then coming as an intercessor on behalf of your family. And of course, not just I pray for them. I've got other people to pray for. I pray for you. I've got, there's so many people to pray for. But that's the role of an intercessor. What does an intercessor do? He stands between people and God and brings their needs to God to get an answer that bring blessing to them. What's the fourth thing he does? The fourth thing a priest would do as they came out of the presence of God is they would bless people. They would bless people. Now, I'm going to make this really practical in a moment, show you just exactly how it works. Now, the role of a priest was to keep the fire burning on the altar, keep the passion for God alive, to keep in the presence of God regularly, having a worship time, uh, offerings to Him of thanksgiving, uh, interceding for those around Him, for the lost, the unsaved family members, uh, various other friends, workmates, whatever, and then to come forth and to bless them. To bless them means to speak and to minister the life of God. You can't bless people if you've got nothing to give. Well, you all got so quiet now, eh? Someone, I must be speaking to someone. I know they all go quiet when I'm speaking to them. Okay, so that's a priest. That's what a priest. So, so that raises the question, well, then what are the sacrifices? Because notice it says we're, we're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So that's great news because now we don't have to get a lamb and uh, check it out and make sure it's okay and then cut its throat and shed the blood and splatter the blood. Don't have to do that anymore. Our, our sacrifices are spiritual, and this is what God always intended. So what does it look like? Let me give you four examples of spiritual sacrifices, and they're quite clearly laid out. So you can see what they look like. Here they go. So I'm going to pick the first one. It'll be in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Here it is. And it says, Now, therefore, be imitators of God like beloved children. So children expect to copy their fathers and copy their parents. So the Bible says be imitators or be followers. The word follower means to be an imitator or a copier. So God says, be a copier of your dad. How about that? So you're called not to copy the world. You're called to copy your dad. And you can't copy your dad if you don't talk to him, relate to him, get to know him. We're called to be imitators of him. And, and what, is, what does it look like? He says, and walk in love, walk in love. H how do you copy God? You walk in love. You walk it. It's a daily lifestyle. Walk in love. As, and it gives the example. As Christ loved us and gave himself for us, See, and it's, it's a sacrifice to God that's pleasing to Him. It's very, very clear that Jesus' life to walk in love towards people is sacrifice because you don't always want to. Your natural man doesn't want to always be loving. See, what does it mean to walk in love? It, first of all, it's a walk. It's something you choose to do every day. This is who I am because I'm copying my father. Don't go copying someone else. Well, they did this. I'm going to do that. Now, that's nonsense. That's not godly people. Don't do that. He says, when you walk in love, this is what walking in love is. I show patience. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy what others have got. Love doesn't puff itself up and self-promote. Read it in 1 Corinthians. You can see what it means to walk in love. Love forgives. Love is patient. Love bears things. He says, now what was Jesus like? Jesus was mobilized by love because that's what God is like. If you want to walk with God, then walk in love. Choose to love people. You say, well, they're so nasty, some of them. I know. That's what, but if you only love the good people, anyone can do that. The Bible says that. In the world, they love the good people, and the people that are nice to them, they're nice back. But he says, it's not so among you. He said, there's no grace or power of God in that. The power of God is shown when you can walk in love and bless the people who curse you and pray for those who take advantage of you. 
but it's a choice of a lifestyle. You want to be a priest of God? Walk in the same spirit that Jesus did. That is, it's a sacrifice. It costs you something. Why? Because it costs you. You'd rather actually be angry at someone than forgive them. So it costs you to forgive. But the blessing is you walk in peace. Go to the psych unit. You find lots of people tormented with unforgiveness. And you find many Christians are tormented with unforgiveness too. See, the peace that God gives that comes out of walking in love is to be desired. It's an, it, it's an atmosphere that comes off your life. I've seen people walk in, the, walk in the room and the whole room gets tense. They're not in peace inside kingdom of heaven, we walk with God and walk in the spirit of love towards people, which sometimes means saying the truth, what needs to be said, the right time speaking the truth in love. But Jesus walked in love. And it says love is sacrificial. He gave himself. How did he give himself? He gave his time. He gave his energy. He gave his gifting. And then finally, he gave his whole life. Love is always a giver. But I found many people are takers. They just want what they can get. And when they got it, they walk away. That's not the Spirit of God. That's not being a faithful priest. That's not being walking in love like our Father is. It's walking in the Spirit of the world. It's walking in the old nature rather than walking in our new identity, which is actually a spirit of love. I'm like my Father. He's a loving person. I've got to learn how to walk in love and draw on the Holy Spirit who flows out of our heart and the love of God flows out of our heart by the Holy Ghost. So number one, walk in love. Walk in love. When you all got challenged by that. Walk in love as Christ loved us, given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God. Now notice that when Jesus walked in love and was kind to people, his, his life was an offering to God. To walk in love and, and treat people the way they don't deserve is actually an offering to God, to honor him. I'm actually being his representative. People forget that. We still live so much under the law rather than realize my identity is a child of God. My identity is to represent him. I'm called to represent him. And if he's loving, I'm called to be like that. So I need to learn how to walk that way and live that way and run everything in my life past that filter. It's got nothing to do with people deserve it. I mean, we didn't deserve it either, but God came. You understand you've got to get out of, they don't deserve it. You've got to get out of what about me and learn. Actually, if I receive the love of God, I can then minister and give that to other people. And it's very practical. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love means you don't react when people do dumb stuff. People do dumb stuff all the time. Don't react. Don't get wound up. Don't get angry. Be patient with people. When traffic's holding you up, just be patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. And people are nasty and mean or whatever, be kind. You show kindness. See, that's a sacrifice to do that. Why? Because part of you doesn't want to do it, so now you've surrendered what you'd prefer to do. Ignore them, leave them, cut them off, and now you're doing something that you don't prefer to do. That is love in action. And when you do that, the blessing of God is upon your life. Whoa. How about that? So it's a life of serving people and honoring people. I found that many people, when they come to church, they just think this thing, what's in this for me? And they don't understand if that's the attitude you have, it's an immature attitude, it's the attitude of a child. What do I get? What do I get? Oh, they got more than me. That's a childish kind of deal. We need to grow up, and then when you grow up, you start to serve. You start to be kind to others. You start to take on the nature of God and show love and kindness and, uh, and so on to other people. And so that's part of our walk. It's part of our journey to grow up, not have that kind of mentality. And uh, it's a commitment to do that. It's a sacrifice. See? Where it says in, in uh, Luke 9 verse 11, it says, Jesus, when people came to him, this is what he did. This is what love looks like. When people came to him, he made them very welcome. And then he shared the kingdom of God with them and healed them. That's what love looks like. Makes people welcome. Makes people welcome. You know what? One of the reasons Jesus was criticized so much because he made people welcome. In Luke 15, verse 1 and 2, he says, the sinners and the tax collectors came to him and he made them welcome. And not only make them welcome, he gave them something they didn't deserve. He treated them to honor. He gave them a meal and was hospitable to them. And everyone looked at him and said, what he's honoring people who don't deserve it. He's making them welcome. They're all crooks and schemers and scammers and whatever. And he's making them welcome and putting honor on them. What's this? He said, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. 
This is what love and action looks like, that people are made welcome in your world. And the, the dilemma is if you feed too much on the media, you'll become angry at the world, judgmental against the world, instead of actually making people welcome. I was in a church recently, and uh, I was interested to talk to the young pastor of the church. They're needing some help in there. And they had a, a church of young people, about 520 young people. And of the 520 young, and when young people, it means all under 30. The whole lot were under 30. And, uh, and, and I asked him about the makeup, and he said, well, almost all of them are from broken families, single parent families, and who've got about 10% are gays. And they were all in the church. And they, they, God touched them. They were made welcome there. I was in another church in another city, and uh, they felt to reach out to the people from broken families, to reach out to people who are orphaned, the people that have been abandoned. And uh, so they started to fill the church up with solo families and then with uh, people that have been adopted. The pastor himself adopted a child, and, uh, and, and everyone laughed at them and ridiculed them. But he said, that church is now the biggest church in that city, thousands of people. And it's just an amazing church because they made people welcome who everyone else despise. They receive. That's what love looks like. It makes people welcome rather than take a look and judge them and dismiss them and walk by. You understand? This is what it looks like to be a priest is we walk in love and love is sacrificial and meets the needs of people. That's what it means to bless people. Jesus walked in love. And we've still got to do a couple of other things. Let me show you a couple of other things. We find one scripture in Romans chapter 12. Let's have a look in Romans chapter 12. So to walk in love will require this. Romans chapter 12. And uh, in verse 1, you know the verse very well. It's an old favorite one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Know what it says? Present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, here's the second thing that we do. We make ourselves available to God. Make yourself available to God. And notice it says that when you do this, it says, it, it just, the word acceptable doesn't really describe it. It means to be, it brings God great pleasure. So you can read it like this. Make yourself available on a daily basis to God like a continued living sacrifice for him because this brings him great pleasure. And then it says, and it's reasonable to do that. Why is it reasonable to make yourself available to God? Simply this, because he has done so much for you. It's not unreasonable for him to expect something. You see, religion, you come to a service and you go away and just do your life. That is not what this is about. Jesus called us into covenant relationship to be priests to our Father where we would offer spiritual sacrifice, intercede, and then walk and bless people. So he says, now present yourself, your bodies. Now, why does it say present your bodies? It's very simply this. Because you're a human being and your body carries you everywhere you go. God's desire is he's a spirit being. He wants to express himself in a physical world. The way he does it is through people. That's why it says present your body. In other words, it's saying make your life available to God because he wants you to be his hands to help someone. He wants you to be his, his voice to speak to someone and minister to someone. He wants you to be his eyes that show compassion and concern for people that are broken. He wants to express himself through you. So when it says present your body as a living sacrifice, it means surrender your will and make yourself available to God. How do I know it says that? Because in the book of Hebrews, Jesus wrote this. He says, uh, sacrifices and offerings, you're not interested in God, but a body you have prepared for me to live in. Lo, I come, as it's written in the book, to do your will, O God. That's what he's saying. You prepared a body for me. So Jesus, a body was prepared for him to dwell in by his father. And why did, why did he need a body? So he could do the will of God in the earth. God's desire is to show his goodness in the earth. He needs people to do it. He's not the pastor. The pastor is to equip people, to lead people. The leadership team is to provide the environment where you can grow and develop and then live this kind of life. Will you make yourself, now no one can make you available. You know, I've noticed this, that when people, when God sends people with needs into our life, it's always inconvenient. 
You just have to decide whether you're available or not. So day by day, I would start off, one of the things I do in prayer is I present my body, my soul, and my spirit, every part of me to be available for God today in whatever way he wants to work. And that will usually mean an interruption, something different to what you expected. And the, the issue is, are you available or not? Now notice it, it's not unreasonable for God to say, I want you to be available to me. That's not unreasonable. What is unreasonable is for you not to be available. That is really unreasonable. Someone gave us, imagine, imagine if someone, uh, you were in desperate danger and you're about to die and someone stepped in and saved your life but lost theirs in doing so. Would you feel grateful? Well, that's the whole point, you see. It's not unreasonable that you would show kindness to the family of that person. It's not unreasonable. That would be what you would do. You think, how can I show kindness? They've given up their life. Oh, I need to find their family and show kindness to their family. So it's the same with us. Jesus gave up his life. It's not unreasonable to expect the first place I'll show kindness is to his family. Well, his family's next to you. Have a look at them. Say hello. They're right next to you. They're, they're right next to you. They're right next to you. It, it, see, this has all got to have an outworking somewhere. So, so what can I do? So, so basically, I need to learn to yield my life to bring pleasure to God. And how does that bring pleasure to God? I find his family and bless his family, help his family. You can't do that if you just, all you're doing is come to a meeting. It's always about relationships. Okay, let's get to this and you'll see it here in this next one. So see then, it's a sacrifice, it's an offering. But notice it pleases God, it brings him pleasure. When he sees you every day, say, God, here I am, I'm available, Lord, today. I want you to work through me, Lord, let your love flow through me. Give me a vision and a passion. Give me the ability to see the needs of people around me, not just walk by. Give me ears that will listen to people and hear their heart because there's so many people got no one to listen to them. See, that brings pleasure to God. Oh, yes. But when people say, no, no, I've just got my own plan today. I'm not even going to pray. Oh, how disappointing. That's so disappointing. That's not what you, you call for something bigger and better than that. So let's have a look in Hebrews chapter uh, 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'll give you the last couple. Hebrews 13. And here it is here. And again, the context is sacrifices. We won't go into it all. We just pick up the key verse in it. And uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and around about verse 15. It says, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, even the fruit of our lips, giving thanks or uh, homologio, speaking uh, and declaring his name. So that's what it said. The sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. So here's another sacrifice we need to do. We need to not make ourselves available to God alone. We need to develop daily intimacy with God. And what does that mean? It means I need to set time aside to build my relationship with Him. And it starts off with an attitude of gratitude. I start being thankful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've been. And one of the ways you show gratitude, you pray in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, you're thanking God and blessing God. So we need to, all of us, set aside a time. If I want to be a priest to God, I need to keep the fire burning. The best way to keep it burning is to actually spend time in His presence near Him and being ignited by His presence daily. Spend time in His Word. Spend time with Him. And not just time alone, but also through the day. You can constantly pray in tongues through the day and be thankful through the day. You can stop in the middle of the day, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Lord. Life is so good to me. Thank you, Lord. Your blessings on my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So you can do it daily. So, and it says it's a sacrifice that brings God pleasure. In other words, it costs you something. What does it cost you? It'll cost you time. It costs you time. Oh, I'm too busy. Really? Have you noticed how badly your life's going and how stressed it is? Maybe if you put the altar of the Lord back in its right place, maybe you'd find everything else would come into place. Because the history of Israel, the history of hundreds of years of Israel, was every time they neglected the altar, the nation went into decline and stresses magnified. Maybe the stresses are partly caused by the fact your priorities are wrong. And we need to get them right. Okay, notice the next one here, the one I want to get to. And here it is. And then it says, uh, verse um, 16. But to do good, but do not forget. It's easy to forget this. To do good and to share with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, the word share is the word koinonia, mean to fellowship or to come together in agreement. So to do good means to help out or to minister to the needs of others. So he's saying, this is a spiritual sacrifice. When you are kind and help someone else out, that is a spiritual sacrifice that pleases God. 
the first place to start is in the local church. As you have opportunity, do good to all men, and especially those of the household of God, Galatians 6. So doing good, doing good means to help people, be kind to them, minister to them, take whatever gift you've got and pour it out to them. And it says, and to, and to, and to share. That, that's a very bad translation. The word is koinonia, which means to share in common. It means to belong and participate in community. So what he's saying then is it's important that you belong and participate in community. In other words, you need to make your commitment to God and to his people tangible. So turning up in a crowd of 500 or 1,000 people is a tangible way that I show my commitment to the Lord. But it's not koinonia because actually it's an inspirational, encouraging meeting. I need to have a small group that I connect to. Koinonia can only really take place if you have people that you're in relationship with. And it's a sacrifice to do it. It's a cost to do it. And Pastor Dave was talking last week about loneliness. Well, loneliness is the fruit of something else not happening. And so it's no use trying to shift the fruit. You've got to deal with the root cause, which is I'm actually running my life out of alignment with God's design. God's design and his plan is I be in fellowship, I be in connection, not just with everyone. Praise God, I'm with everyone. Yeah, you're with no one. That's how it really works. And that's the delusion of the social media. It seems to give the appearance of relationship, but actually it's not. It's superficial. There's no real connections that are face-to-face. Here's the person I've got to love and be kind to. Here he is. And when he's in trouble, I come and help him. Now, you see, so koinonia must find an expression that's tangible. And that tangible thing is always a group of some kind where there's committed relationships. Now, see, the thing is, it says it's a sacrifice. What is the sacrifice? Well, here's the sacrifice. It's some time. You've got to set aside a time to connect. Like, I'm appalled. I'm literally appalled at some people that they just that they're part of a group, but they hardly ever turn up. They just turn up when it suits. They've got a bit of a cold tonight. It's a bit cold out. It's a bit cold, a bit wet tonight. I don't think I'll go. I thought, dear Lord Jesus, what the heck is that? And then you wonder why you're lonely. And next thing you know, you're backslidden. And then you've got your children's problems coming up in about 10 years' time. Come on. You've got to actually build godly priorities. Your children read off you how important God is to you, how important they are to you. But you've got to model things. You can't just expect them, someone in a Sunday school, to teach them what they need. Actually, parents need to model things and speak things. So, so part of it is we need to be part of a group. Now, whether it's a mixed group or whether it's a family group or whether it's... A, so long as the, the group is about God connection. It's, about rela- it's not just like, well, we meet around bikes. Let's have a talk about the motorbikes. Well, that's okay to gather, but it must go past that to talk about our life in common with God. There needs to be testimony what God is doing. I found one of the things that makes a group healthy is the simple thing is I want you to tell me where your life is with God right now. What is God doing in your life? What is God speaking to you about? And, and when we have that level of connection, what is God doing? When, when, we were, when I was growing up in the, in the church, what we had was we'd have a meeting. Everyone was expected to share something that God had been speaking to them about. What you've been studying in the Bible. That's how we grew every week. I never go to a meeting without having something to share. It was embarrassing. And yet people today come and it's like a consumer thing. You want someone to do it all for you. You've got to actually spend your time with God and spend time studying because to get to know Him and to carry something that can bless others. And you're part of a group. Why? Because there's some things in the Bible cannot happen without you being connected into a group. So it costs, it's a sacrifice. Why? It costs you time. It costs you time. You know, oh, I'd much rather do this or that. No, no, turn off Netflix, turn up to the group. It's much better for you. It costs you time. What else does it cost you? It's your priorities. You have to set right priorities. It's a commitment. Every commitment is a cost. You say yes to this, then you say no to something else. So what are you, commi- what are you committed to? And you find for some people, they're committed to a lot of TV watching, a lot of media stuff. They're not committed to the things that would build their life. It's a sacrifice, but it produces a fruit. See? And, and it's not just as a, another part of the sacrifice is contributing. So don't just come and just take from the group, come to give. 
bring whatever you've got. It doesn't matter how little it is. If it's your thing, bring it to the group. Bring something into the group. Participate in it. Listen, the Bible, this is what it looks like. If you look in the Bible, it'll tell you about 20 commands to do to one another. How can you do those commands to one another, like love one another, be kind to one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, uh, minister to one another? See, how can you do the one another's in the Bible if there's no group that you're part of to do it with? It just won't happen. You actually have to have a place where you can express the gifts that are in your life and receive from others. That's how you grow. And yet this is the hardest thing. We've got a a society that's full of lonely people, but the reason is because they're disconnected. God places us in a body that has them. What it looks like is you're part of something where you know them by name. The Bible says the members, here's one, should have the same care one for another. In a church system, they expect the pastor to care for everyone. What a lot of nonsense. It doesn't work. Just run him off his feet. He can't do it anyway. Never called to do it. It's just a religious thing. The Bible says the members should have the same care one for another. And you say, well, I was crooked, no one knew. Well, I don't know how I'm supposed to know. You didn't tell anyone. You know, if I got a, if I'm, if I got a sore tooth, I ring the dentist, make an appointment. You know, something's wrong, I'm sick, I call the doctor, make an appointment to the doctor, whatever. But people in church, they get something down on them and they don't tell anyone, expect, oh, they didn't, no one cared. Listen, the reason what happened was you never built relationships where someone would notice you were missing. That's the problem. I've always had groups, always. We've hosted them. I've had breakfast. I've run groups all our life. And they were just fun. I loved it all. It was great. We built relationship. We prayed together. We laughed together, told jokes together, ate together, had fun together. And, and God came. I, I, would, I just love that. Why would you not want that? I mean, it's, this, it's, it's, a, it's an environment where the, the members of the body contribute to one another and build up the body. We need what others have got. So why don't people go? Well, there's a couple of, two or three reasons. They'll give you one reason. And they found in 1 Corinthians 12. And here's what it is. It says, well, because the eye says I'm not the, uh, the hand, therefore I don't belong. So what he's saying simply is, because I'm a bit different, I won't join. Everyone's a bit different. But that doesn't mean you don't join. I mean, the eye is different to the hand, but it's still part of the body. And, and you need both. So one of the reasons it says people don't connect into groups is because uh, they think, well, I'm a bit different, so I don't fit. Or they're kind of different people to me. Well, I've listen, I've met people in church I'd never meet any other place in my life. I would naturally, I would never have connected with them. It's just, it doesn't matter that we're different. Listen, God put me in a church. I've come out of university. I've got a master's degree in physics. I've got distinction in physics, honors in maths and whatever. And he puts me in a small town, 5,000 people into a church where there wasn't one person got school certificate or above. Not one. They were all uneducated people. And I'm put in there among them. And what God taught me was, you need to learn what loving people is about. You need to learn what community is about. You learn to humble yourself and come into that group. And it doesn't matter with your fancy education and all the stuff you have. Everyone, you've got to learn to relate to ordinary people. It was the making of me. It made us who we are. But there was a cost, my pride. Oh, it was embarrassing. It really was. But however, I got over that. They said, I remember, I remember my boss was a Christian in the headmaster's school. I remember looking at me with a, with a look. He gave me that look. You know, that look. What? What? You're mixing with that group of people. But you know what? It was my making because it broke the pride of all the university stuff, taught me about ordinary people, taught me about how God works simply through community and the need and importance to just connect with one another. Come on, we need it. So, so the, other, the other reason it says, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, well, the eye shall say to the hand, I don't need you. I'm an eye, I can see. So, so pride will stop us connecting because we think I don't need anyone. And individualistic culture, which is all about me and my ministry and my this, my that, my whatever. But listen, the Bible says we need one another. I need what others have. And no matter how gifted you are, you still need what others have because God designed the body so everyone's got something that's unique to them. You've got to draw it out. So our responsibility as leaders, create the environment where everyone can bring out what they got. And if it's, good, if, it's, if it's great or if it's good, it'll bless people. If it's a bit off, we can help them grow and correct them. And they would never get that correcting otherwise. 
they just grow and become bizarre. Lone, lone rangers become weird strangers. They're weird. All the, lonely, all the people that won't connect into groups, I have found majority of them become a bit weird. There's something in them isn't right. And the, and the dysfunction is they can't connect with ordinary people and just laugh. See, you may be able to stand up and do some fancy thing. When you're in a group around a table, all of that's all gone. You're just you. That's what's the advantage of it. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, we're all just the same. We're all together. We've got problems. There's challenges in the marriage, challenges in work, challenges here. And you need other people around you you can share with. You're never called to go it alone. We're called to be part of a body. The members having the same care one for another. And the body grows by that which every joint supplies. You have something to supply. And we haven't got anything. Now listen, that's wrong thinking. You've got something. You just haven't worked out what it is. Get into the presence of God and get worshiping. Get into a group. Start to find what you've got. Some people are great at hospitality. Some are great at making cakes. Some are great at oh, there are all kinds of. There's so many ways you can be great at serving. There's no limit. So, spiritual sacrifice that brings pleasure to God. It's about the altar. It's not about loneliness. Loneliness is the fruit of not building the altar. When we connect, we become known. People know. You know, I get in groups, people could tell if I'm down straight away. You can't hide. I mean, if you've got no one, if you're not there, they ring up and say, where are you? <laughs> Otherwise, weeks and weeks go by and then you gradually trail off into whatever. You see, but if, if you're in a group, they what happened? Where'd you go? We didn't see you. Everything okay? Can we pray for you? You get a need, you gather around the church, the group that, that, that you're part of, they will flow out to help you. And so help is provided when you're in trouble. How do you know that you're not going to have trouble? Well, you don't. But one of the best insurances is to be part of a group. And at least you know you'll have some people around you when you're in trouble that will say, listen, we want to pray with you, cry with you, serve you, help you. We're with you in this. You're part of us. You see, that's the, that's the blessing that comes as a result of the sacrifice the altar to build that relationship. And then the final thing it says is to obey those who have the rule over you and submit to them as those who must give account. Now the words are quite harsh. If you read the original language, it basically means make a friend of the people God has appointed to leadership. And it says, and cooperate and surrender and allow them to lead you and speak into your life so that their ministry is one of joy and not of sorrow. In other words, it's saying God has appointed people in the church into roles. They're not perfect people, but that's irrelevant. It's an appointment of God to bring help to your life, to rightly connect. That's a sacrifice. But when you do it, then there's a blessing comes into your life. So the fire of God falls on the altar. I believe today there's people need to build a fresh altar to the Lord. Perhaps it's your personal commitment to Christ. Perhaps it's your relationship and your prayer life. You have to reestablish the altar. Perhaps there's an area where you've got some other things, some things operating, you're in bondage of some kind, and that's become an idol to you, and you need to bring it to the altar. You need to build an altar in your heart again. God, here I am. I bring this thing to you. Perhaps for some of you, you've neglected prayer in the marriage. That's a new altar to build. Perhaps for some of you, you've neglected prayer in the family or devotions in the family. Repair the altar of the Lord that's broken down. Perhaps for some of you, you've avoided being part of a group. Repair the altar and make a sacrifice and set the priorities that God and His family will be important in your life. Jesus said, whatever you did to these, my brethren, you're doing to me. We, we, see, individualism means I, I want it all with me and God, and I don't get it with people. Actually, the Bible is very clear that your relationship with God is reflected in your connections with people. So this points you back to Him. Coming to Him connects you to people. So when we avoid close relationships, it tells us we're broken and what we have with God is an experience with Him, but we're not whole. So what altar you need to build? Perhaps the altar is around your finances and honoring God and your finances. 
Perhaps the altar is an issue that you have in your life and you've hung on to it for so long and you need to say, God, today I build an altar in my heart and what I'm laying down is this issue of bitterness that I need to let go of. The issue of offense, the issue of distrust. There's so many things I found my life is one continued altar to the Lord every day. Daily sacrifice, presenting my body to Him, making an offering to Him, being available to use, be used by Him to serve. And it's costly. But all oh, the benefits, the benefits. Today, I, I just know that God is speaking for us to build a fresh altar. You know what the altar is. And you know what the sacrifice, what it is you've held on to, your independence, your, your isolation. Whatever it is, there's a reason for it. Come and say, God, I bring it to you today. Whatever this thing is that's holding my life, Lord, I put it on the altar today. Now show me what the roots of it are. Help me. Put fresh fire on my life. The fire comes on the sacrifice on the altar. The altar is your heart. What is it you're going to present to the Lord today? Perhaps some of you got a gifting and you're withholding your gifting for whatever reason. Come, make your gift available again. Perhaps some of you have withdrawn. You're not committed anywhere. You're not building anywhere. How can we say that we're in real fellowship if we're not building anything in God's kingdom? There's something missing. Sons are builders. We build what God is building. Now, it's all very well to say, well, and this and this. actually, God puts a group of people in front of us and it comes down to who is it you're connected with? Who are you serving? We can serve in a team and have fellowship and connection and relationship. We can be in a small group. Whatever it is, I'm not really worried. The thing is, the principle is being connected. The price of not being connected is loneliness and dangerous spiritual vulnerability. But the value of being connected, oh my, it's a challenge, it's a sacrifice. And sometimes you look at that group and you think, my goodness, what am I doing here? I've done that a few times. What am I doing here? This is awful. <laughs> but I got through that. It's a sacrifice. Persevered and God broke through. What sacrifice do you need to offer to the Lord today? Let's all stand together. Let's just come right now. Just come. I want you to come. You can stand. You can kneel. Lift your hands. Kneel down. Bow down. You know what it is. But the fire of God comes on the sacrifice. No sacrifice. No fire. Christ, Christ has paid the ultimate sacrifice for fire to come from heaven. But sacrifice is what sustains the fire. So why don't you have a decision right now? Come. You know that there's a thing that you need to say, God, I'm bringing this to you. Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. Would you come now? Would you come now? Maybe the issue of finances, maybe the issue of your prayer life, maybe the issue of a, a bondage in your life. Whatever the area is, you say, God, I need to come today. I need to build a fresh altar. Perhaps it's in your marriage, building prayer. Perhaps it's in your family, building a devotional time. Perhaps it's in your personal prayer time. Wherever the area is, you say, God, I need to establish a fresh altar. I'm going to do that right now. If you've drawn back from serving, drawn back from engagement, drawn back from involvement, come, deal with the offense. Overcome that and say, God, I'm going to reconnect again. I will front up. I'll be part of what you're doing. I will connect and begin to build relationships and walk with other people and hear their story and share my story. And We're going to grow together. Come, just come, come. There's others need to come. Perhaps you've not given your life to Christ. It'd be a great time to just come to the Lord today and say, God, here I am. I open my heart and I welcome Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I want to have the fire of God in my life. Perhaps there's others and you've lost your passion for God and you say, God, where did I lose it? God, I want fresh fire on my life. Just come again. Come again. Come again. Say, God, here I present myself. Anyone else? Perhaps there's some people need healing today. You've got a physical need in your body. Why don't you come to the front and just put your hand on the part of your body that you're sick so people know what it is to pray for. You say, God, I need healing today. I come to the sacrifice that Christ made. By his stripes I am healed. I'm going to believe today for the healing power of God to come and touch my body. If you're sick in your body, come. Just come. Put your hand on that part of your body. Are we ready? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? And you say, God, I believe you're calling to me. 
You're calling to me. I've been running from this thing. I need to today establish a fresh altar in my heart. I need to lay something down that I've been holding on to. I need to surrender something I've been resisting. Whatever it is, perhaps you've got a call of God on your life and you, you, you've, you've been resisting this call. You say, God, today I surrender to the call. You know, there's a wrestling over calls of God. Perhaps it's in the financial area. Whatever it is, you say, God, today I know you're talking to me and I come to build an altar in my heart. I come to bring a sacrifice to you today. Come on, let's just lift our hands to the Lord. Bless your have sickness and want healing you please keep one hand on the part of your body needs healing let's just worship the lord let's worship the lord I want the ministry team to come now we're going to just stand back for a few moments we must first offer an offering of praise to the lord the fire comes on the offering so let's just make our offering let's build an atmosphere of worship let's build an atmosphere of gratitude in which the spirit of god will come we have our pastors and leaders and whatever come up. So ready to pray for people. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You worthy of the hell. You are worthy of it all. If you're watching online, please do the same. Why don't you build you an altar wherever you are? If you're watching online, what is it God's saying? You need to lay that down. You need to surrender that. Why don't you, even as you watch online, you kneel just where you are. Kneel in front of whatever you're viewing it on and say, God, the anointing that's in the house, let it come on me right now. I want fire from heaven where I am, in my room. You You are worthy of it all. your fire onto people right now. Father, let the fire of God fall. The fire of healing. A fresh fire let it touch people right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we release fresh fire to touch people's lives. The fresh fire, fresh passion, fresh zeal, fresh anointing. Come upon people now. You are worthy of it all. Thank you, Lord. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. We're just musicians and singers are going to continue to minister. And if you need to go home, pick up children, whatever, please feel free to leave. Just if you could leave quietly. So there's still an atmosphere here to worship. And uh, if you want to stay on and just worship, that's fine. Musicians and singers will keep doing that. And uh, if you want to just stay and pray for a little while, that's fine as well. We're just so glad you're here today. I pray blessing on you, blessing on your family. I pray blessing on the work you do, the labor of your hands. I pray blessing and prosperity. I pray God's richest blessing. I pray the fire of God will burn on the altar of your heart, that there will be a passion for Jesus, a love for Him, that you will overflow with that love to the lives of others. Amen.